Aaron Madoff, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Uh, this summer, one of the most significant cases really to impact the operation of the state, the taxpayers, the beneficiaries of pensions, is this whole question about a bill that was passed in the spring that would put a cost containment, we might say, on pensions. Uh, along the way, and one of the major decisions that came up on July the 3rd from the court was a ruling on what we call Kinerva that impacted or dealt with the issue of health care benefits. Uh, can you walk us through, first of all, the what are these issues? You got health care and you got the pensions. And then, as I understand, there was a hearing today that maybe you can then get us to the point of what's new in the case. But just if you might give us a little bit of that background so we can reacquaint ourselves with the issues. Sure. It's important to remember that we have two separate bills, two separate laws that are at issue here. One is what had been Senate Bill 1313, which was uh, codified as Public Act uh, 97695. That law required that money be deducted from pension checks to pay for health insurance premiums, whereas in the past the state had been providing uh, the health insurance free of cost to the pensioner. Then later, a second law was passed, what we call Senate Bill 1, which became Public Act 98599. That law uh, cuts uh, automatic uh, annual increases. It takes away some of the uh, compounding. It cuts uh, the definition of how much people are going to be getting in their pensions. It's a much bigger cut into uh, pensions in that sense. The Kenerva case had originally been filed here in Sangamon County, and it was strictly related to Senate Bill 1313, the health insurance issues. The Circuit Court of Sangamon County threw that case out from the very beginning because the court determined that the health insurance premiums were not pension benefits. Remember that the challenge here is that the pension clause of the Illinois Constitution prohibits diminishment of pension benefits. By finding that the health insurance premiums were not pension benefits, the Circuit Court of Sangamon County said the case is over, I don't need to do anything, and it went up on appeal. Then, in the meantime, we filed the challenge to Senate Bill 1, that is the uh, Pension Reform Act, which essentially guts pensions. That case has been proceeding among other challenges under the same pension protection clause. Of course, the argument as to whether or not um, the automatic annual increases or what people are being paid are indeed pensions is a little bit lesser, although the state still has been arguing the point. Clearly, the amount of money that you're getting for your pension is a pension benefit. In the meantime, on July the 3rd, the Supreme Court reversed the Sangamon County Circuit Court on the health care question determining that the health care uh, benefits were pension benefits. So that case went back down to the Circuit Court of Sangamon County and was first up last week. SUAA filed at that time a petition to intervene in the Kenerva case. In so doing, we also filed a motion for uh, judgment and for injunctive relief. Now, it's important to remember that the reserve sovereign powers, which we have discussed before, uh, was not brought up in the Kenerva case initially. The Reserve Sovereign Powers was an affirmative defense that would have been brought up by the state if the state had been forced to answer the complaint. But because the Sangamon County Circuit Court had initially found that the complaint didn't state a cause of action at all, there was no reason for the state to bring up an affirmative defense. The result is there was some question, at least the state is arguing, that the Supreme Court didn't really consider the Reserve Sovereign Powers. And can, can we revisit for them, uh, the audience, what is the reserve sovereign powers? Sure. The reserve sovereign powers defense is this concept that the state has an obligation to the citizens. It's also been called the police powers. You might have heard that term. And since the state has this obligation to the citizens, it can do certain things. It can abridge certain provisions of the Constitution or laws in order to uh, meet its obligations to protect the citizenry. A constitution, if you will, is a set of boundaries, a set of parameters. It provides limits on what the government can do. But within those limits, there are exceptions. The classic example that we all think of is we know that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution says that you have a freedom of speech. 
And yet we also know that the state can prohibit you from yelling fire in a crowded theater. That's part of the police powers, because if you could yell fire in a crowded theater, everybody would rush for the exits, people would get hurt. And so the state is trying to exercise that police power to protect the citizenry. And so the concept is, is that while the Constitution provides certain limits, there are spaces where it will say, but we're not limiting this. And so the state has taken this attitude that the reserved sovereign powers permit it to abridge the pension clause in this case because the state's financial condition is so bad that if it has to pay these pensions, uh, the state believes it would hurt the state in other ways. And, yeah, they, they might, if I might even paraphrase, they might say, hey, look, you know, our ultimate responsibility is to protect the citizenry. We cannot diminish our ability to enforce the laws we don't want the courts to go out of business. We don't want the Illinois State Police to go out of business because we're putting all of our money, or not all the money, but you know, so much money into pensions that we can't maintain law and order and the operation of government as we've come to know it. In essence, that would be their the argument. The state is trying to argue that, although the information we've seen so far, uh, we're not so sure that uh, the state couldn't operate. Uh, there are other ways to deal with the problems, but that is certainly the state's complaint. Now what happens uh, is that we go to the pension litigation that we're in with regard to the Pension Reform Act that we've had up today. And the question that we have been presenting all the way along has been, do you need to consider this reserve pow sovereign power defense, this police power defense, or is the pension clause itself simply immune from that defense? And we have argued that the pensions were underfunded going back to 1970, even before 1970. And because they were underfunded, the pension clause was added to the Constitution because at that time, the Constitution uh, uh, delegates were concerned that the state might later come in and say, we don't have the money. And so it was a reminder, you have to fund those pensions because you're going to have to pay them. Now, what happened in Kenerva when the case came back down, as the SUAA intervened in that case, we filed a motion for judgment in that case, asking the Sangamon County Circuit Court to determine that based on what was said by the Supreme Court, the reserve sovereign powers simply do not apply at all to the Pension Protection Clause. So while the Supreme Court didn't technically have it in front of it, it because it wasn't a uh, an affirmative defense. It wasn't in the case when the Supreme Court had it. The Supreme Court's ruling certainly, uh, we believe, stated that you can't use reserve sovereign powers defense. So what happened last week in uh, in front of the... Can I enter? It, you think they said that even though they, in other words, it's almost inferred because you, you're arguing, I think, if the Supreme Court would have said you can use the reserve power clause as an argument that they would not have given the Kenerva decision the way they did, is that right? Certainly not the way they've written it. The way it is written, it specifically says you cannot diminish a pension, period. The indication is that means that you can't use reserve sovereign powers. The state's view is, sorry, we didn't raise reserve sovereign powers. That wasn't before the Supreme Court, so the Supreme Court couldn't have come to that conclusion. When we intervened, in the Kenerva case and appeared in circuit court last week after the case had come back down, we argued to the circuit court that indeed the Supreme Court has said that you cannot diminish and you cannot use the reserve sovereign powers. By granting the preliminary injunction in that case, the circuit court of Sangamon County really indicated, maybe even said that as I read the Supreme Court opinion in Kenerva, I agree with SUAA and other plaintiffs that it says you can't include the reserve sovereign powers. And that was really important because now we go before a different judge, but in the INRI pension litigation case regarding the Pension Reform Act, and the state is still saying it wants to put forward its reserved sovereign powers defense, which it says it did not put forward in Kenerva. And what we have been arguing is that based on the way the Supreme Court handled Kenerva and indicated that the reserved sovereign powers doesn't apply, it doesn't apply in this case either. And as a result, we shouldn't have to go through all of the facts that the state is putting out to explain its financial condition. We simply decide is there a diminishment, and if there is, game over. So that's where we stand going into today. One of our earlier, or maybe even our first uh, conversations on this topic, uh, had a timeline where 
you were going to be getting depositions and gathering inf information to go to arguing a trial, we thought perhaps in early spring, February or March, if I recall. Probably even later than that. What we're talking about there is the case management order. People have this image that uh, they watch Law and Order and there's a murder and an hour later there's a jury verdict. It doesn't quite work that yeah. way in real life. What uh, happens is, is but, the, but, but the larger point I wanted to make is that that's what we had kind of laid out as a timeline, a but now that's being changed. changed and changed dramatically, I think. Huh? Yes. So originally what the court had done before the Kenerva case came down was to say the, uh, the plaintiffs had filed a motion saying this case is over because there is no reserve sovereign powers, and the court said, all right, on September 29th, the state will respond to that. And on September the 29th, the state will also file its motion saying the case is over in the state's favor on all issues. Meanwhile, the state had to identify its fact witnesses and expert witnesses by uh, the end of August. And we got, I think, five or six expert reports uh, explaining the budgetary concerns and the financial concerns of the state last week. Uh, but because of Kenerva, we filed additional motions. Uh, SUA filed a motion to strike that affirmative defense, which the court took up today. And what the court did today was it struck the schedule. Originally, it had said, you get from the state the expert reports at the end of August, and you have to give your expert reports by the end of October, and in between, you have to take the depositions of the state's experts. What it did today was to say, we're striking all dates. On October the 3rd, it did move back a few days, the state will file its response to your motion for uh, um, to strike the affirmative defense. There's an additional motion for judgment on the pleadings. There's a, um, the summary judgment motion that was filed back in June. And the state will file its uh, uh, motion for summary judgment. And then we will have all that October 3rd, and then we will go into court on October 8th, and we will discuss the situation. So between now and October 8th, we're not spending the time uh, going through all of the state's experts or deposing the state's experts and we're not going to be required to produce our experts by October 31st. Uh, if the circuit court were to throw out the police powers argument, uh, does that in effect gut the state's argument, number one, and two, if then the court were to rule in your favor, let's talk about what happens next. Is that the end of it or do we go to an appellate level? If the court rules that the reserve sovereign powers do not apply, essentially at the trial court level, the case is going to be over. There is, um, uh, in Kenerva, there'll be an issue that of recovering monies that were taken out. But because we got an injunction in this case back in May, that's not an issue. We don't have to recover monies. So if the court were to come to the conclusion that the reserve sovereign powers do not uh, apply in the in repension litigation case, then the only question is, does the law diminish uh, pensions? If it does, it's unconstitutional, period. And I think that we can all look at it and say, look, people will find that the amount of money they're getting is less. It clearly diminishes it. I'm sure that the state will come back and say that certain items, uh, such as uh, actuarial tables or perhaps the annual annuity increases, aren't really part of the, the core pension benefit, and there may be some arguments on that. So there is work to do. And then the case will go up to uh, probably directly to the Supreme Court for uh, ruling. Uh, but we, and I'm assuming, of course, that this, the court determines that there is a diminishment of pensions. But we think that that's relatively obvious. The um, mistake that people make is they think it's over. And it's not. There's a great deal of work that uh, has to be done. And we can't just rest on what has happened today and assume that it's over. Uh, that's the way cases are lost. It's and, uh, some people were doing a victory lap as far as those arguing in favor of the pensioners, a victory lap after Kenerva, thinking that really signaled the Supreme Court and how they would rule. There's an indication how the Supreme Court rules, but that victory lap is well premature. That victory lap was started back on July 3rd when the Supreme Court issued its opinion in Kenerva, and yet we haven't started the process of trying to collect the money back because we still don't have a judgment in that case. The Supreme Court gives its opinion on a legal issue. It then comes back down to the circuit court to work on the case. There's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done, and if we stop doing the work, people will not get the money back. They may not get the judgment. And, and the money on the health care payments? That's what we're talking about, right. So on that, 
we have been having the state taking out money for health care that the vis-a-vis -vis Kenerva now, the state is saying, or the, the court is telling the state, stop taking the money out. Is that right? That's right. We got when, that when, motion for injunctive relief last week. Okay. So they said, stop taking the money out. If I'm a pensioner and I'm getting my check and I'm saying, hey, wait a minute, here it is, September, and I'm still getting money taken out for health care. I thought that was supposed to stop. When might they expect to say, see it in their check that they're no longer being dinged for health care? Very good question. Certainly, the November check should not have a, uh, a de deduction. Likely, the October check won't. But it was only on August the 28th that the uh, Circuit Court of Sangamon County granted our motion for injunctive relief and ordered the state to stop taking the money out. But the state is not uh, operate uh, like a matchbox car. I mean, it's a 10-ton truck going 80 miles an hour. It can't just instantly stop. Pension checks were already sent out. Calculations were made. So certainly, you're going to see money taken out for the uh, health care premiums uh, September 1st. Uh, what comes after that? They're going to do what they have to do uh, to stop that from happening. Now, if it goes, let me, let me go back to the pension issue, and I apologize if you have already answered it and I didn't grasp it. If the Supreme Court hears the case, let's say the circuit court rules in your favor and it does were to go directly to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court issues their ruling and as a reminder to the audience, the Supreme Court can take whatever time they want to issue it. They could do it a week later, they could do it two years later. One would think they would do it relatively quickly given the issues involved. But it, once the Supreme Court issues their ruling, if they ruled in favor of the pensioners and saying these, uh, this bill does diminish and therefore is unconstitutional. Is that period done, end of story, and the pensioners are safe? It depends upon the ruling that we get from the Circuit Court of Sangamon County, but as to this particular law it is. But again, that's a situation where pensioners who are doing a victory lap and saying, great, I'm going back to bed and not worrying about it, they're going to get burned because the reality is, is that these pensions are underfunded. The state owes a tremendous amount of money to fund them, and the state is still looking for ways to meet its financial obligations. So you've got really three steps here. If we go back to Kenerva for a moment, we have not won Kenerva. We've asked for a judgment, but there's more work that has to be done. If we were to all go home today and say, we're done, the state wins. Doesn't matter what the Supreme Court said. You have to go in and you have to say, judge, Based on what the Supreme Court has said, you have to enter judgment in our favor. And we are still arguing that. That's not over. There's work that we have to do. And anybody who says it's done has just lost it. The same holds true in the in repension litigation, the uh, Pension Reform Act litigation, where we were up today. There's no question that what the uh, court did last week in Kenerva indicates that the sovereign powers do not apply to the uh, pension uh, clause period, and therefore the Pension Reform Act also must fall. But if we simply accept that and go to bed, the state wins. There is a tremendous amount of work that still has to be done. Why would the state still win? I mean. Because the court has not entered an order finding judgment in favor of the, of the pensioners. So it would be just merely a theoretical point at that point? I mean, what would the court, or do, does the, just the court might say, let me use an analogy, if it were sure. divorce case, maybe people can relate to this. The court might say you're divorced. But that then leaves all the whole issues of who gets custody, who has to pay alimony, to whom. It's is a lot is more it an analogy, analogy that. like Not that? Not quite, because here's what the Supreme Court has said. The Supreme Court has said, we believe, that the reserved sovereign power defense does not apply to the pension clause. It has not said that the Pension Reform Act is unconstitutional. It's simply given us a principle of law. We now have to ask the Circuit Court of Sangamon County to take that principle of law and say that based on that principle of law, the Pension Reform Act is unconstitutional. If we don't ask for that or we don't go that far, it still stands. The burden is still on the plaintiffs. So we have to do that. I see. So if the court said the pension or the uh, Police Powers uh, Act uh, is unconstitutional or uh, invalid. As a defense. As a defense. The state might say, okay, as a defense it's invalid, but you haven't ruled the law that we passed unconstitutional. Right. That's another step. And that's important because the first thing that we have to show technically is that 
the law diminishes pensions. If the law doesn't diminish pensions, then it's not going to be in violation of the pension clause, irrespective of the reserve sovereign power. The reserve sovereign power is relevant only if there's a diminishment. Then the pension clause says you can't diminish the pensions, and then the state can come in with reserve sovereign power. So we're jumping slightly ahead in that sense. But you have to go in and you have to get your judgment, and then it can go back up to the Supreme Court, and then the state can argue all of the issues that it wants there. Now, we'll close out here shortly, and I hope the audience understands that these are very complex issues. We're Absolutely. trying to make them relatively understandable and simple, but they are complex. On Conerva, which deals again with health care, and we already covered this, so I'm just kind of reminding people. The state initially started taking money out of their paychecks. That's been ordered to stop. That money uh, that had been coming out of paychecks or pension, or anyway, checks uh, will no longer be taken out. We would think it would, those deductions would stop coming out by at least the November checks. And hopefully October. Hopefully October. Uh, on the other hand, the pension benefit where the state has passed and Governor Quinn signed into law changes that would lessen what the pension benefits, that was never implemented because everyone knew it was going to be challenged, as we're talking now. It is being challenged. Not quite. It was never implemented because we moved the court to put a stop to it before it was implemented, and the court agreed. Okay. So the, and the larger point for the, those, the, the pensioners, in other words, right now that's never been right. deducted and uh, if it goes if the ruling goes the way you're arguing it won't be so there's no what happens going back to the deductions that have been taken out of the checks for health care what happens to that money do the recipients i mean do the people who's had that money coming out of their paychecks are they going to get that money back and if they would when would they get that that is the next step that we are working with in the Kenerva case that's one of the reasons we intervened last week so to recap, there are two things that we tried to accomplish last week. The bigger thing I think that affects everybody is to get that ruling in that case as to what the Supreme Court meant, which means that everybody wins in the Pension Reform Act case. That is to say that the reserve sovereign powers don't apply. That's critical to everybody. That's why people, even if they didn't have health care taken out, are uh, doing their victory laps. Uh, the second thing in that case that needs to be done, as you said, because there wasn't an injunction, because the money did come out of the checks, we have to go back and collect it. That could be a, a difficult issue. We have to find the money. We have to, to identify it, break it out of the uh, budget, and I don't have all the answers yet. Right now, the state is trying to gather information for us on that. We will be back in front of uh, the uh, court in that case um, uh, sometime in October. I don't have the dates on the top of my head. And lastly, I'll just recap, and you can respond or not, but as you alluded to, there is a reality that there's a hundred billion dollars in unfunded pension benefits. So promises are being made to people relative to their pensions that there's not money currently available to pay those. Now, the state would have to do something if you win and the pension reform does not come uh, to be, uh, there's still that financial matter that the state's going to have to find a way of, of coming up with the actual money. So, you know, one's a financial reality, one's a legal argument. We're talking about the legal case challenging to the law, but there still is that major issue. How will the state finance the pension benefits that it has made? And there are a couple of things that the state can do. One is we believe that there are other ways to raise the money. There are other places that it can make uh, cuts. It can do it. But the state has shown that it wants to attack that uh, obligation to pay these pensions. We're in a difficult spot right now because people were getting paid their pensions going back a decade, and so they didn't get up and complain. They didn't fight over it. An ounce of prevention back then could have been worth a pound of cure now. But we're now in the situation we're in. And so you can be sure that the state is still going to have to take actions to figure out how it's going to do this. And those actions may still be a tax on those pension obligations. So it's doing a victory lap on a battle does not win you the war. So it's very important that people keep in mind that we are winning some battles here. We appear to have won a battle in, in Kenerva. Uh, we had some things go down last week uh, in the Kenerva case that are going to immensely benefit 
uh, everybody else who just has pensions, even if they didn't have health insurance coming out. Uh, that's, that is a, a big, big victory for, for them. But even so, we still have to win this case. We have to get it done at the Illinois Supreme Court. And then we still have to be in a position to be ready for the next attack that the state has on those pension obligations. Because if you go back to sleep, we're going to be back doing this litigation. Yeah, and uh, again, not to make this into an hour-long conversation, we'll wrap up, but there are a number of states, I don't know how many, that tax retirement benefits, or tax, a tax pension benefits. Illinois does not, but that could change. They could change the law and say we're going to tax pension benefits to get some money back that way. That's certainly one predictable way of doing it, uh, and I can see the possibility of the state passing that tax and we will need to go back into litigation to fight that battle. I would argue that that is still a violation of the Pension Protection Clause, but there's certainly an argument to be made there. We've been winning the arguments thus far, but we only win arguments that we make. And if we just let the state do that and we don't go in and challenge it, that's exactly what can happen. All right, we're in Madoff. We thank you again for taking the time to update us. My pleasure. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel.